Um, good evening, everybody, and hi. Uh, I'm Gökçe from uh, the Oplarge team, and I would like to thank uh, Pau members to invite us to this beautiful event. Uh, actually, Bioplarge is a research project combining bioplastic and architecture, and I'm here to, to uh, present today uh, because of my team members could not come. So my topic is material experience in the age of consumption. Um, actually, this is a very familiar uh, image that we know. Uh, plastic, plastics, um, as we know, uh, is the most uh, widely known and found material on Earth. And uh, plastics are made of petroleum and it's a light component and they can be produced in any type and any form. Uh, and they can be used in uh, packaging, uh, building materials, automotive sector, um, toys, cameras, watches, and everything in every uh, material. But uh, the overuse and the overproduction of plastics, petroleum-based plastics, have, have, have had a negative environment on the uh, negative impact on the environment as we confront today. Um, yes, this is a river uh, of flowing trash in somewhere in the uh, earth, as we can see. Um, and we can ask, is this our future? And because we know that for many years, uh, land, landfill and incineration, which means burning, have been seen as the only realistic alternatives to get human waste from the earth. But this is a really, I think, uh, important situation that now we are uh, living. Um, well, actually, this cute plastic duck is, uh, is very different, I think. Uh, it's following me everywhere I go. I always wanted to have one of these plastic tags, but never because my parents did not buy me. Maybe because it was a plastic, I don't know. Uh, and yesterday I took this picture from the one on the left, from a Hotel Granitza a pool. Uh, and it's uh, staying there, but I think today someone stole it. It's not me. <laughs> Uh, and they, re they replaced it with a new one. Probably they have too many uh, in their stocks. And uh, since these uh, toys are very mean, uh, when a kid grows, so he or she directly throws it uh, as a weight. Waste, sorry. Uh, but actually, in 1992, a cargo ship traveling from Asia to uh, Japan was, sorry, to, from Asia to United States was hit by a storm. And it was, it was carrying too many containers, and nearly 30,000 uh, floating ducks and bed top toys were spilled over the sea. Actually, this innocent plastic duck is the symbol of rubber manufacturing in the light, late 19th century. And with the advent of petroleum based plastics, uh, they were produced in thousands and millions, uh, actually. Uh, and every year, there, actually, the, uh, when, when they were spilled, uh, into the ocean, many of them uh, began their epic journey and they are still traveling around the world. And a few years ago they were found in the, on, in the British uh, shores, in Japan, in Hawaii, and some of them, I think, entered the Mediterranean Sea, uh, probably <laughs> will travel, and uh, if you are lucky we can see some of them. But well, actually in uh, Kosovo uh, they are still here, so even a city without a seat, it's really, uh, I think, a contradictory point. Well, actually, this uh, point, I mean, the, ocean, the point that they were spilled is really uh, interesting, I'm going to tell it now. But later, this uh, inspired the scientists to study ocean currents, because this area is actually uh, a place between Japan and the United States. It's called the Pacific Trash Vortex. Here you can see it. Um, and this makes us rethink about uh, what we use plastics for. Actually, in the European Union, um, about 40% 40, 40 of petroleum-based plastics is used in packaging, and about 20% of uh, plastics is used in building cons and construction that we are very familiar with, and uh, about 9% is used in automobile. Uh, um, in China, uh, I mean, the you know, uh, plastic production and pl plastic consumption is growing rapidly, followed by Europe. Um, in Europe, actually, plastic production is um, growing not very rapidly, but uh, globally, it's um, yes, it's uh, increasing a lot. We can say. Uh, maybe I can skip it because it's too much statistics. Maybe. 
Uh, in the United States case, the, uh, the situation is nearly the same. Uh, these are the statistics of United States plastic production. And they are mainly used in uh, packaging again. And secondly comes the building, uh, which is 15%. And the other is consumer products, like toys and different kinds of things. I think it's also noteworthy that uh, they are also used in medical devices like processes, so which is uh, really hard to replace with any kind of uh, material uh, in the production. Um, as we said, that landfill and incineration have been seen the realistic alternatives, but today recycling uh, is important. But actually, on the other side, about 40% of uh, plastic recycles in uh, European Union is about energy recovery, which is gaining really importance. And probably, uh, as a young generation, uh, when you are doing your architecture or when you are thinking about architecture, this will be a great uh, part of your reality. And this makes us, again, rethink about how and where our waste goes to. Uh, most of them are landfilled, and uh, the others are combusted for energy recovery and recovery for composting, let's say. And today, globally, only 5% of plastic is recycled, which is very uh, low. So this is an alerting point, I think. Um, actually, this is the place where I mentioned before. It is where the plastic bags are still <laughs> uh, wandering around. This is Pacific Trash Vortex. Well, actually, this place is, um, let's talk about it, it's, its size. It is about 700, uh, 700 thousand kilometers and 15 million square meters, which means that it is more than twice the size of whole United States continent. So it's a huge, it's a huge place. And it is the Earth uh, and the biggest floating landfill on Earth. Um, actually, it's legal now to throw your trash into this area and this, the garbage from this, the garbage is mainly uh, the waste of uh, in northern countries, uh, United States and Japan and some Nordic countries. Uh, and since this place is far away from every nation's coastline, uh, no nation wants to take the responsibility to find funding to clear up all this mess. So it is floating, your trash is probably uh, floating and eaten uh, by the animals, marine animals, or they are consumed by the ocean bacteria somewhere here. Um, well, they say that it is out of sight, out of, out of mind, which is, I think, uh, very uh, important. And they end up in, the plastic ducks end up in the stomach of another duck or, uh, let's say, uh, marine mammals or birds. Um, so, deriving from this uh, situation and regarding environmental awareness, we wanted to make a project about um, how architects gain, how architects or designers gain their material experience and what can we do about this uh, process, but just to understand, not to find a concrete solution, but just to understand what uh, point we are now uh, staying at. So our research project's aim is to experiment with the material and the immaterial and to create a kind of biodegradable, eco-friendly material uh, that can be used uh, as both as a facade material in architecture or as a kind of interior furnishing uh, or any kind of accessory. And also we ask the question, we are not really sure about it because we are still uh, in the process, uh, can the production of bioplastic material, uh, an alternative to decrease the amount of cement in concrete, because we know that in cement we use, you know, as as you know, we use agrega and agrega for agrega production and uh, for processing it, you consume too much energy. So maybe uh, bioplastic material or biocomposite material used can reduce the, both the amount of concrete uh, agrega in concrete and maybe it can also um, a kind of eco-friendly for the uh, material for the concrete. Uh, I'm just skipping this because I don't want to focus on too much, but it is Erwin Karana's uh, material engagement and material driven design method that we are now on track to understand. So uh, I'm just skipping it because actually we are not very uh, much focused in it. Mike Ashby uh, says that we have entered the age of biopolymers um, and well, actually, the, this 
table has shifted the concern of uh, researchers, of many architects, designers and engineers uh, to think about bioplastic bio and biocomposite materials. Um, actually, bioplastics are, are and have been uh, produced since the last 10 years, mainly, and some of our, uh, the uses are polylactic acids made from corn, uh, as you can see from the left image, these plastic cups, and again, plastic bags can be used, produced. Uh, again, as architects, we are very familiar with these 3D printing uh, machines, and the filament is made of, again, corn, uh, polylactic acid. You know, lactic acid is, a, is an acid when you are tired, so your, your body produces that acid, and it's a kind of uh, where corn is really tired, let's say. Uh, on the, uh, again, left image, a 16-year Turkish student designed uh, a bioplastic material made of banana peels, and researchers are still continuing to produce it. And the other is shrimp shell, which is not vegan, and the other is cellulose acetate, packages and there are many different chemicals inside of course, or both organic and inorganic. Uh, actually bioplastics uh, are under the head of biocomposites uh, and they can be um, uh, mixed with natural fibers or synthetic fibers. Uh, yes. Okay, uh, let's have a look at some examples of uh, the first bioplastic or biocomposite materials. This was uh, Henry Ford's design in 1941. He designed this car made of uh, soybean and hemp, and he mixed them and kind of uh, put them in a formaldehyde, as you know, that mm, the chemical material that the be uh, dead bodies or corpses are soaked in. Uh, and according to the observers, uh, the viewers, uh, the smell, uh, the, I mean the automobile uh, was smelling really awful. <laughs> uh, and this was just before the uh, Second World War, and, but uh, the use of plastics in automobiles was, uh, this was a starting point. And uh, actually the World War interrupted the production of this car, but this is the, I think, the milieu of it. Another inspirational but uh, artistic project is by Meredith Miller, and she designed this kind of uh, sugary um, porous fence uh, in Michigan, and she wanted to uh, observe the decaying of the material, the death of the material, which is, I think, very um, what we are actually what we actually have to think about uh, because we use material and. Uh, they degrade or they biodegrade or they uh, end up uh, millions of years later. So I think the, uh, born, the birth and the death of the material and the observation is really important. Uh, another uh, alternative or another uh, experimentation is by an artist, uh, Juliet Pepin, and he designed these or he made these by plastic materials and he combined them with, with coal like cotton and like um, uh, wool, uh, like fiber, natural fibers and different kinds of materials. These are just only the very uh, few of them. And Johan Vladry, uh, they designed his bioplastic with, uh, again, stone powder, with, with, uh, combined with blood of an animal. Uh, and he got good results, but this is a bit strange. <laughs> we, we don't experiment with this kind of things. Uh, and on the right is, uh, it, it's, it's, I think, it's beautiful and a very different sub, uh, material. He combined it with stone powder and it's, uh, the material is both plastic and also a kind of stone, a hard material. Uh, this is from um, uh, Master's Thesis by Marilu Valente. She designed bioplastic uh, bricks in her thesis and this, she also tried to understand the tensile strength of the surface like this. Actually, bioplastic production and um, uh, I mean research is really uh, growing rapidly in Europe and the United States. This is from Netherlands, and this is a facade material uh, produced in um, Netherlands, made of potato starch. Uh, and this one, the last one, is the biggest one that we were inspired. This is Argos Kim bioplastic. Podium uh, in Stuttgart. Actually, this place is uh, a fire exit of a building, so it's really high uh, performative it's because it is resistant to uh, fire. And these are 3D uh, laser cut modules, and there's a steel structure inside. 
And this 90, 90, about 90% of the materials inside this bioplastic made of uh, cornstarch is renewable and there are some additives like uh, lignin made, of, made from wood and cellulose and different kinds of things which is really quite interesting. So um, driving from this point we made our first bioplastic surface, let's say it's a kind of plastic, similar, similar plastic. <coughs> this is our team. Uh, the one on the, uh, on the, in the middle is Ahmed Bal. Uh, he's a construction engineer and yeah, doing his PhD on earthquake engineering. And on the left is our third year student, Shamin Shanturk. Uh, the other is me, and we also have an advisor from the chemistry department, Professor uh, Murat Atesh, who's always guiding us, because actually we understood within this project that we as architects don't have any idea about, actually we don't have actually uh, an idea about chemistry, because every physical reality, every physical material is made of chemistry, so uh, I think we are very uh, apart from that uh, reality. Uh, these are the first ones that we have made. Um, actually, we carried this project to our architectural studios. Here are the very pre preliminary ones that we made. Uh, the one on the left is an Australian friend uh, who just came and just joined us for the experiment. Uh, these are again the, the very first ones. Actually, bioplastic uh, is made of at least three materials, according to Stevens. First, you need a biopolymer, which can be gelatin or agar-agar and starch. Uh, the second is plasticizer, which can be glycerin uh, or sorbitol, and you need to add some additives. Gelatin is, as you know, it's a kind of uh, bone uh, skin of an animal, so it's completely animal-based. And agar-agar is the vegetarian version of uh, gelatin. Uh, it's a seaweed produced in Japan, and vegan people do eat it uh, very often. Starch is actually one of the cheapest and the mostly found, widely found uh, material, polysaccharide, in the world. It's stored in the plants, both in the seeds and stalks. Uh, and it can be in any form, in any, uh, let's say, in any molecule shape, like amylose and amylopectin. Uh, and it's again the cheapest one. It can be found in, for example, potato, uh, rice, vets, uh, or different kinds of uh, uh, cereals. Uh, glycerin, as we know, it's plant oil. Uh, and sorbitol is a kind of vinegar, which helps these bi biopolymer molecules break down. Uh, it can be, again, uh, apple vinegar or grape vinegar or white vinegar. So these ingredients, these basic ingredients are combined together and they are cooked and they are, uh, afterwards they are dried uh, and they have to be cooked just before the boiling point of nine, uh, it's 95 Celsius degrees and there's a pinch of salt that you have to add. So this is very much like cooking, but it took us a lot of time to make the first experiments because we were very bad cooks, I think, so we got help from our mothers in our uh, restaurant. Uh, this is from our process. Actually, we started the project last year, uh, but again, it took us one year to understand it. And um, very recently, we have started realistically, and uh, we have a funding from our university semester project. Um, we are about trying to combine white plastic with organic and inorganic materials, and we, we want to understand the potential of this material as a construction material. Uh, so we are generally and usually doing 5 to 5 cube samples and then uh, enlarging them to 15 centimeters to perform and to, to make the performing performance tests. Uh, we are not sure, sorry, we are not, um, uh, actually we are very hesitant about creating a new material because actually these are all handcrafted. So we are just trying to understand the nature of it. Uh, this is again from, uh, from the process. The one on the left is made with edible bioplastic. Actually, you can eat this bioplastic. Uh, the one on the left is mixed with coffee grout, the waste of coffee. Actually, we, you, we drink too much Turkish coffee and we have this uh, dark and uh, yes, dark grout. Uh, we use them. And the one on the right is a completely edible one, but it's a bit burnt because this is after the drying uh, process in the oven. Um, and these are again mixed with different things, like for example, marble powder, uh, <coughs> natural fiber, uh, silica fume, fly ash, and again coffee. These are uh, what our students made. Uh, they mix it with egg yolk or uh, different parts of eggs. 
and stone or different kind of, again things. Uh, this is like a growing circle that we are now focused on. I, I'm just not going to explain here, uh, all of them because I want to show you a single video. Uh, we prefer to work with potato because it is one of the cheapest starch resource. Actually, corn starch is a bit uh, cheaper uh, in the world, but we prefer to work with uh, a material that is not genetically modified. Uh, actually, these materials are really interesting. These are uh, called as pellets. These are compressed agglomerates uh, made from completely raw materials. It is the, uh, they are made. In, they are uh, usually made of sunflower canola stalks or rice stalks, and they are uh, the ones on the uh, up are uh, completely raw, and the ones on the below are mixed with coal. Normally these are in agricultural sector, they are burnt in spatial spaces and biodiesel is produced so in agricultural uh, areas or cities. So these are really widely known and actually what, uh, where we are doing this research now is these are materials are really, really local and they are really cheap. And actually they come from this canola field. Actually canola is an edible oil, we eat it but actually it's not healthy. Uh, it's, it, it's a kind of brand name. Uh, these are from our cooking process. Well, actually, I'm sorry for the primitive uh, pictures because actually we don't have a kind of uh, architectural building. We are very new university. We are like in our third year. So this is only the technical school's laboratory. Uh, we mix them all together and these are sealed according to uh, American uh, Society for Testing Materials uh, standards. Uh, and we added uh, some different materials like aggregate in a 15 centimeter cube uh, by plastic. Uh, but when we started the project, this project, we don't we didn't have an oven, so we left it open air drying. And as you can see, there are some cracks on it. This is the natural process. Uh, then we added some silica fume uh, by 40 percent. Uh, the 50 percent is edible by plastic, and the, uh, the other. Uh, part is silica film and aggregate, aggregate and these are still molded. Uh, we tried uh, working with different materials. This is a, a thing, fantastic uh, synthetic uh, fiber known as poly polyethylene fiber. Actually these are used in concrete uh, pavements uh, or like uh, garages because it, uh, when you use this material you don't need to use a kind of steel mesh in the concrete, so it really uh, reduces the cost of the, the cost and the weight of the concrete, and it is really cheap. Uh, they are, but they are only uh, produced in the United States. Um, so we both dry them in an industrial oven at uh, 60 to 8 Celsius degrees uh, from a few minutes to a few days, and on the right is uh, drying in a bakery oven at uh, 200 Celsius degrees for just a few minutes and maybe 30 minutes, just to make a comparison of how the material performs. Um, okay, these are the, some of the results. Actually, the use of fly ash can be uh, uh, a suggestion or a question in biocomposite or bioplastic materials. Actually, fly ash, as we know, is collected from you know, coal mines and from the bottom of the coal mines. And actually, they are really hazardous materials on their own. Uh, you don't. You, you shouldn't, for example, braid uh, this material. But actually, they are uh, used in concrete since the 1930s. And the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, uh, say that it is safe to use it when you are mix it, when you mix it with water or different kind of chemicals because it releases. Uh, I mean, it hides its chemicals. They say. But um, since there is a kind of we think that there's a kind of pressure on this uh, agency from the sector, from business, from construction sector, because it's you know it's large, it's, it's a very large sector. Uh, so this, uh, I mean, the use of fly ash has to be again uh, regarded. Actually, even green uh, uh, or lead certificate buildings use fly ash in concrete. But maybe uh, actually the fly ash is. Um, uh, recycled, but the only recycling method or way is uh, just making it landfill. There's no other alternative for it. I mean, it's, it's not recycled. Of course, it stays in landfill for many years, for maybe thousands of years. 
And also, uh, there's a research that says that this fly ash uh, is toxic to the groundwater that we drink. Uh, and the other alternative is in some countries, it's thrown directly into the sea, which is a very uh, disastrous thing. Uh, so maybe the use of fly ash in bioplastic material or biocomposites can reduce the amount of this um, side product. Uh, actually, this is, it has a growing sector uh, in masonry, in brick making, and there are some many researches about how to recycle this hazardous material. Um, probably in the following, I mean, in the future, we will see uh, fly ash bricks. Uh, these are again one of the ones that we have made with coffee grout and with different fibers. This is purely edible with coffee grout, uh, poured on a natural rubber surface. Actually, the material seems to uh, get characteristics or steals characteristics from the surface it's directly poured. So if you pour it on a uh, rubber surface, that it's, it's a kind of flexible material. If you pour it into a steel, then it's more rigid and more uh, like a kind of aggressive, let's say. Uh, these are 15 centimeter samples uh, just before the uh, drying. Um, and these are balsa molded or steel molded. Uh, this is again the bakery oven, and these are after the uh, drying in the bakery oven. A bit, uh, they, are, they are a little bit uh, burnt, uh, but they are still okay for us to understand. And then we actually uh, mix it with cement to uh, see how it performs. This is not a very successful experiment, we only made one. So actually, American uh, Society of Testing Materials defined the criteria for uh, production of any kind of material. And uh, it has standards for bioplastic, it, too many standards, because since it's uh, biologically based, uh, it's really, uh, I mean, it's really hard to uh, make too many experiments because it's really complex, it has a really complex structure. Uh, for example, you have to calculate glass temperature, tensile strength, elongation, and even earthworm tests, which test the quality of the soil and how the worm in the soil affects the quality of uh, the starch in the potato or uh, corn. So it's really complicated and too expensive now. So we are just uh, planning to make only tensile strength and only very small amount of them. Um, okay. Uh, Roland Barthes once said that uh, petroleum-based plastics is uh, in the essence of uh, the alchemy. I mean, uh, it's an that plastics is in an endless transformation. It's a reckless uh, substance, and yes, he was absolutely true. But actually, bioplastics and biocomposites can be a second paradigm regarding aver uh, environmental awareness and also. Uh, the need uh, to rely on more sustainable feedstocks and to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, so maybe it can be a second paradigm shift or alternatively it can be uh, used in niche market, which is uh, due to its uh, expensive costs now. The production is a little bit expensive, but in the very near future, they say that uh, it's going to I mean the, uh, uh, the cost is going to be reduced and uh, we are probably going to use this material very often. Uh, and maybe it can be an alternative to replace or replace the cement or the aggregate in uh, concrete and provide a matrix for carbon, glass and arid fibers. Actually, we haven't experimented with these fibers, they are a little bit expensive, but the use of natural uh, fibers is and raw materials is uh, much common and much cheaper. Um, and uh, I want to end uh, with, I have to quote this one, because he said very perfectly, I think, by Stevens. And he says that we can take nature's buildings, materials, and use them for our purposes, without taking them out of nature's cycles. We can be borrowers, not consumers, so that the process can continue indefinitely. Um, I just want to show you, if, since we have a little bit time, I want to show you a small video uh, that we did, and then for uh, only two minutes, um, I would like to uh, I would like to invite Agnes and Luisa uh, to here to explain uh, our two-day intense workshop uh, called as BioPow, which we used our pows in the Christian Architecture Week uh, to 
uh, understand the nature of bioplastic and to uh, e experiment with haptic perception. Uh, and they are going to tell in, in, in a very short time. Now I'm just I just want to show you the video so that uh, it can be better understood. We have please Agnes and Luisa here just to uh, tell what in Albanian and uh, in English what they did in the workshop. Uh, okay. Luisa is missing, so Agnes is Hi, 
Hi everyone. Uh, this year, uh, Pristina Architecture Week team has organized some workshops uh, for people who want to participate in making the world we live in better. So this year, I've decided to attend the workshop called Biopa with our tutor, Mrs. Essen um, which we thank a lot. Um, we made some experiments uh, using edible bioplastic materials and made a lot of th things with them. We were a group of 80 people, divided into four groups. We worked together and made uh, functional objects uh, by mixing uh, starch, uh, vinegar, water, uh, salt, glycerin and adding some additives like coffee grout, pepper for coloring and natural fibers. The main goal of this project uh, was through our work um, to aware people for the products that we produce every day which are harmful to the environment. By producing bioplastic products we make a big favor to our world and the world we live in. So after the lectures are finished we suggest you to look outside our work of two days with our tutor. Thank you. There's a table outside in the hall so that the students can explain what, uh, how they experimented with it. And maybe there's a, 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 another thing that we did. Uh, I, just wanted to, I just want to show it in a minute because it was requested by uh, Mission Architecture Week, which was actually not the part of uh, Real Power Shop. Uh, in our university, uh, a few years ago, sorry, last year, um, well, Actually, this was in Tekirda, a small waterfront city in the neighbor, or neighborhood of Istanbul. It's a very small city and it's a kind of agricultural society. It's, uh, I mean, the people are really open-minded, but there's a kind of Yemishaft, Yeselshaft difference, like uh, as uh, Weber defined, you know. Uh, so, you know, these agricultural societies can be a little bit uh, closed uh, in their nature. Uh, so in order to interact with people uh, uh, in the city, in the small waterfront city in Tekirda, we wanted to interact with the borders of the city, which was actually really hard uh, at that moment because there's not a proper urban space for gathering and people are just living in, uh, by their own, uh, which is a really contradictory thing. So we wanted to interact with them and also uh, our uh, project on environmental awareness uh, overlapped the needs of the municipality which has now become a greater municipality with 200, uh, sorry, 800,000 people. Uh, so we just made, the, made this small installation. We collected more than uh, 17,000 used paper cups in the university campus and in the city and then washed them and dried them and then Students, we made a kind of we stapled them and uh, stitched them together into modules and then combined them in order to make a kind of small uh, uh, pavilion. And this was installed on site in, in the World Environment Day uh, last year. And we actually wanted the uh, city dwellers to just to participate uh, in the project because actually uh, the people uh, you cannot. Uh, understand, you cannot tell your project or, uh, by telling or by writing with uh, some, of the, some of these people. Uh, in order to make them interact in the process, you need to show a kind of image or a kind of, you need to directly uh, make a physical uh, reality in order to them to engage in the project. Because that was the main reason. So maybe you can explain uh, what you did. Um, we used uh, used cups for making the, for the pavilion we did and I think it, it looks interesting as it looks as a sculpture and explains a lot of things explains uh, about the world we're living in and all the things that are harmful to our world and uh, it explains a uh, a way better to make it better to ourselves, first thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you.